My name is Charles Epting, and you're listening to the Lost Labels Podcast. Today's guest is Howard Bowler of Marbles. Marbles were a pop quartet founded in New York City in the mid-1970s by brothers Howard Bowler and David Bowler. Howard played guitar, David played drums. They were joined by Jim Clifford on bass and Eric Lee on keyboards. The four band members shared vocal duties, a la the Beatles, and it wasn't only in that regard they were reminiscent of a British invasion band. They all wore suits and ties on stage, they had uh, matching, moppish bowl cuts, and their entire look and sound was very much influenced by the British invasion. Although Marbles were not a punk band per se, they headlined CBGBs very frequently uh, in the earliest years of the club. They shared bills with the Ramones and Blondie and the Talking Heads. Their first single was released on Orc Records, best known for putting out releases by Television and Richard Hell. And they were very much a part of the New York alternative music scene in the mid-1970s, even though their sound was so different from a lot of uh, what else was going on at the time. A lot of times I like to turn to magazines like Trouser Press to see what was being said about these bands while they were current. And I think this paragraph from Trouser Press sums it up very well. Uh, An article by Kath Nemeth said, quote, It's not easy to explain Marvel's music, which is essentially rock, subtly flavored with the wine and garlic sauce undertones of jazz. During the course of a set, Marbles can hurl you back into the heyday of the Hollies and the Searchers without once forgetting that it's 1976. They can be sweet, aggressive, funny, sentimental, and downright amazing within the same 20-minute period. Requests from the audience are now an accepted fact. Quote, we're a band on the rise. We're getting a following. Reflected the methodical Eric Lee, Marbles' pianist and prolific songwriter, What does he see in Marvel's future? Quote, we want to be the best modern pop band. Unfortunately, Marvel's was only around long enough to release two 7 inches, four songs total, in 1976 and 1977, but fortunately, there is a wealth of other material out there to be found. A retrospective full-length album was released a couple of years ago, and if you're discovering Marvel's for the first time, or if you only know the songs that were included on the Orc Records box set a couple of years ago. Um, Fortunately, there is more marbles out there uh, to be discovered by fans today. So with that, I'd like to welcome Howard Bowler, guitarist and vocalist from Marbles. Howard, to start things off, you were involved in the CBGB scene before it really took off, before the scene that a lot of people talk about and remember today even existed. You were, uh, you sort of got in at the ground level. What was it like at CBGBs in those very early days? Well, the early days, I think you could probably imagine it yourself. Before things start to heat up, you just deal with a lot of rubble. You know, you're walking through uh, broken glass and, you know, like just kind of like a depressing environment of New York. We actually started there in 1974. And uh, so we stumble upon this club that we've heard about where, you know, bands can play and uh so, you know, looking for an option of where to play music, original music. And one of the things about CBGBs that was attractive was that they encouraged bands to write their own material. So it was really, really a lot of self-expression. And given the climate in New York at that time, it was really a hotbed for self-expression because of everything going on economically. And uh, just it was a it was a rough time downtown New York. So. We walk in a club, it's like got three people in it. We talk to Hilly and he says, yeah, you could do your Monday night showcase and we play and just things started to go from there. You know, we hung out with other bands there that really had no following. You know, when Debbie Harry started, she was with the Stilettos, which was a three, a three girl band. Um, and, and they, uh, from there, you know, uh, she started Blondie, and Blondie have a lot of people coming to see her, and and uh, at times, so it just built up. From there. Bands such as yourself, Blondie, The Talking Heads, Ramones, did not have a lot in common musically. What was it do you think that made that scene so cohesive and brought everyone together at clubs such as CBGBs? Well, I think the bottom line was ambition. Everybody, for very in various degrees, were they were ambitious um and that ambition plus the fact of being in new york um it's kind of a shared um a determination 
re- regardless of what you're doing and a respect for that because if you're going to survive in New York, especially in those days, uh, it really didn't matter what you did. If you wanted to try to make it, you just tried to make it and you, you went through any avenue that was open to you, you know? And um, so, you know, it was uh, nobody, you know, you think about that, that scene then, nobody really thought in terms of what defined the scene. What, what, the only thing that defined it was we were writing our own material and we were playing live. That was pretty much it. And all sorts of bands came through there. And it was probably what happened is that some of the bands, as they began to make it, they became what defined the sound of the scene. So, you know, once the, we, we played with the Ramones a lot of times, but once the Ramones started to really take off after they got signed to Sire, so what happens next is that it suddenly becomes a punk scene. And so the, you know, the, the people that were <clears throat> drawing the biggest crowds or just getting the most attention in the press would be, you know, kind of like the Heartbreakers, um, the Ramones, Talking Heads, Blondie. Blondie wasn't really punk, but they considered it a punk band because they were popular uh, in the same outlets, you know? So, you know, we all liked each other's stuff, you know? We, I saw Blondie a million times. They were great. And uh, there were a lot of offshoot bands as well. But punk just became the defining thing because I guess that was the sharpest blade in the tool shed, so to speak. So that became the defining sound. When I listen to Marbles, I hear a lot of influence from the Mercy Beat, British Invasion, 1960s sound. Is that what you guys were emulating? Is that what was influencing you? Yeah, it was. It was. We we loved that stuff. And so um, we emulated that. And uh, actually, you know, we had a little, you know, you get influences being in the scene with, with uh, in the punk scene, you know, you kind of get an edge no matter what you do. And uh, so, you know, we had our edge, but our edge was really you know, kind of, um, it was kind of built out of the Mercy Beat sound. And if you listen to the Ramones, you can realize that the Ramones have a, oh, a, a large debt to the Beach Boys. You say that about the Ramones. I, it's always struck me that a lot of what was going on at CBGB's in the 1970s was paying homage to the 1960s, whether it's their cover of California Sun or Blondie with Denise. It seems like that prior decade must have had a lot of influence on the music that was being made. Absolutely was. Look at the haircuts on the Ramones, you know? I mean, they look like British Invasion. So, <clears throat> yeah, there was a lot of that. But, you know, the, the really the defining quality, it, it really was just attitude and determination. And it was, unfortunately, at the same time, with the attitude and de- determination, was it was incredibly self-destructive, you know? I think Richard Hell's autobiography does a particularly great job of addressing the self-destructive streak that you mentioned. Yeah, he's a great writer. I haven't read it, but um, he's a great writer. And uh, Legs McNeil wrote a book called Please Kill Me. I don't know if you read that. That book is a huge part of what inspired this podcast, actually. Yeah, and I mean, it's, uh, you know, he he did... um, You know, I I used to hang out with him. If I'm not mistaken, Marbles was even in an early issue of Punk Magazine. Yeah, we were in a couple of them early on. Yeah. So, I mean, we weren't, for whatever reason, we just happened to be there. It was early early in the scene, and we were pretty prominent in the scene in the early days. We were headlining CBGBs, doing weekend shows. And I think one of the big moments for us was uh, playing to a packed house at CBGBs not knowing that the band that's going to follow us is ACDC. The ACDC? <laughs> you can, it's, it's there in the, it's in some, somewhere buried in the internet. You can find a reference to it. Yeah. We opened for ACDC at CBG. <laughs> that is incredible. I had no idea. Now the first Marbles release was a seven inch on Orc Records in 1976. Red lights backed with fire and smoke. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like working with Terry York and getting Marbles into the studio? You'd played live a lot at that point. What was it like uh, transferring your sound onto vinyl? Yeah, well, we, uh, Ork was great. He had a vision, an artistic vision, and um, he approached us. He wanted to do Fire and Smoke. He had heard the song live, and we were, he wasn't involved in the production of recording. We did that on our own. But Fire and Smoke is a very interesting song. Um, 
that he wanted to release, but we told him we'd only release it if he w- if he would include Red Lights because we thought Red Lights was our you know the song that was getting the most attention, so we didn't want to pass that opportunity. And he was cool with it. He said, "Yeah, go ahead." So that became we became I don't know if we were the second or the third single on Orc Records. That was right around the time that Orc was transitioning from just being a vehicle for television to release music to a label that would uh, release other bands as well. Yeah, it was uh, television. And then Patti Smith, then us. We were the first three releases. The way I discovered Marbles was through a compilation I've mentioned in almost every episode of this podcast so far, the New York single scene on Roar Records, a cassette released in 1982, which features red lights on it. Yeah, uh, you've, done, you've done your homework. <laughs> I just think it's very interesting that already in 1982, you guys were being canonized and immortalized alongside television, Patti Smith, Richard Hell. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you've seen the movie Blank Generation, but um, if you check out Blank Generation, you'll see all of the all of the key bands from the mid 70s that were performing and uh, a lot of live stuff. And there's a eight or 10 minute segment of us um, in that film. It's interesting you mentioned film footage of the band because if you go on YouTube, there's quite a lot of video of Marvels performing back in the day, whereas other bands like television, there's almost nothing in existence. Why is it that there's so much uh, footage of Marvels? Yeah, um, we uh, we just we we like to play live, and um, there were people that wanted to record us, so we just said go ahead. So some of these were like local TV. Uh, stations or live broadcasts. I can't remember exactly where they were all from. Some was just, I have some interesting live footage, like just snippets of live footage of us um, at a venue, I think on Irving Place. I forget the name of the place, but we played there a bunch of times and it's some pretty cool footage that we've not, I don't think we've ever posted it. Um, But we, you know, we, we like to play. We rehearsed all the time and uh, we were pretty like, driven to to perform live um so that i guess that's why there's a lot of live footage of us uh but i don't really know it just that's how it worked out after that initial orc record seven inch marbles only released one other single in 1977 but in 2006 uh, a full-length album was put together of contemporaneous 1970s material can you talk a little bit about that yeah, there was 10 songs that they did. Um, we did a 10-song album that someone approached us later on about. Um, we just went through all of the recordings we had made uh, and <clears throat> pulled what we thought were the strongest ones. So that was the album. Um, but, uh, you know, Forgive and Forget was our second single. And that was one of those weird events where we released the single um, and then someone told us that it was playing on a big local station called WNEW, which was a big New York station at the time. So they put us in rotation and we didn't even know it. We just got phone calls saying, hey, have you heard your songs on the radio? It's like, boy, talk about not marketing something. (laughs) As you watch bands like the Voidoids or the Talking Heads get signed to labels like Sire or Blank Records, was it ever tempting to try to latch on to the new wave movement or to maybe, um, you know, punk up your sound or your look a little bit? Uh, was it ever tempting to try to capitalize on those bands from the CBGB scene that were going off to uh, major labels? Oh, it just basically gets us passed over. I mean, we weren't really thinking. Our, our marketing skills weren't very strong. Um, we were strong creatively, but we weren't really thinking about we, you know, our determination was to get signed. We wanted to get signed like everybody else. And, uh, um, you know, the closest we got were a couple of singles deals. But we were, we just, that just wasn't our DNA. So it wasn't going to happen. Even if we tried, I don't think it was going to happen. You know, so we just did what we did and, uh, you know, um, and just took it, took whatever came our way as a result, you know, so. Um, like I said, Blondie wasn't, they weren't punk. They got signed uh, to private stock records and went out to LA and they ended up, you know, getting signed and having their first, it was like a disco hit, you know? So, you know, it's a, you don't really know what the path is. Uh, you just do the best you can. And 
So, you know, we, we had, we had our moment there that, that was a lot of fun. And, uh, we were drawing nice crowds at CBGB's, um, when we were headlining, but we didn't, I think probably because of a lot of reasons. One is just, we did not fit the mold of what was happening. Even though you guys maybe didn't fit the mold, it seems like there was a lot of symbiosis, a lot of creative energy and community and a real sense of scene that existed at CBGB's circa 1975-76. It was, yeah. I mean, it, it seems fed off each other. There was a very primal energy to the scene that was attractive to everybody that was involved in it. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, that existed there. And, you know, but... Uh, yeah, you're right. That that was there as well, you know. Since your days in Marvels, you've remained very active in the music scene. Can you get me up to speed on what you've been involved with in the uh, in the years since? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, the um, you know it's in the blood. Me and my brother, who's the drummer in the band Marbles, we play all the time together, and we're writing material. Um, and for me personally, um, you know, I don't know. If you were aware that uh, we ended up, uh, me, three of the four marbles ended up doing um, dance music in the 80s. And we had a top 40 record uh, called Saying Sorry, Don't Make It Right with Denise Lopez. And we even credited the background vocals on one of the tracks to the marbles. And if you find that album anywhere i don't know where it is but the record was a uh, number one dance record in the country and it did very very well so we and the music the first album which is i think sort of interesting the first album it's a dance record denise lopez but we wrote all of the material it's a very marble it's a very marbles record it's extremely marbles <laughs> This is news to me. That's something I'm going to have to go listen to as soon as we hang up. Yeah, listen to Saying Sorry, Don't Make It Right, Denise Lopez. So Eric, the keyboard player, my brother Dave, wrote the, wrote the song, and um, the three of us produced it with Denise. And we wrote all the material on the first album. And I think the second single went top three uh, dance in the country as well. So she had uh, some success. Um, in 2005, I ended up <clears throat> um, being a kind of an executive producer on a song that went top five called Move Your Body, which was um, Nina Sky. You may have actually know that record. Sure, I remember that. Yeah, so that was recorded at my office. I had no idea that your post-Marvel's output was so, on the one hand, unlike Marvel's, but at the same time, I feel like a lot of this music must um, come from the same pop sensibilities that inspired you to start making music in the first place. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, yeah, I just, uh, if, as long as you're open, you can do anything, you know, in, in a way. You have to be open to it and curious, and, and then you can take it lots of different places. So um, right now what we're doing is um, me and one of the guys from a band called the Miami that was also a very good non-punk band from the CBGB's era, they were great songwriters, great performers, um, local talent. He and I <clears throat> are working on a television series now about the CBGB days. And you're the first to hear about it. <laughs> I am honored and excited. Uh, this is uh, incredible news. And again, the first thing that comes to mind was the CBGB's movie that came out a number of years ago. Yeah, that was a very good film. Really well representative. Yeah, the guy who played C uh, Tilly was excellent. Unfortunately, he died, but... Uh, what more can you tell us? What, who's it going to center around? What format is the show going to take? Um, well, I can't, I can't give you too much details of it yet because it's a bit under wraps, to tell you the truth. But um, I can tell you this. Um, it's going to be a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> I feel like a lot of the CBGB's legacy has been myth-making. Obviously, you've got the Ramones, you've got Blondie, you've got these bands that went on to become very commercially successful, and they say that uh, history is often told by the victors, and I think that must sort of be what happened with CBGBs, but there's a lot of great bands under the radar, underappreciated, who are equally deserving of having their stories told. Yeah, and that's why, we're, that's, that's why we're doing it, because we feel like the story is extremely incomplete, 
And from our perspective, the way to tell it um, is to tell it about the B level bands, not the A level bands. But they're well known already. What happened under the hood? And that's, I can tell you that much about the show. You have a very unique uh, perspective in putting this together. You don't have to rely on anecdotes or memoirs or hearing this through other people. You were actually there on the ground, and I think that gives you just a really wonderful point of view to be able to tell these stories from. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it'll it's a dramatic series. It's a, a scripted dramatic series. And, um, yeah, there's, there's so much material there. So um, I'll, I'll be able to share more of it as we as we get further down the production side of it but um you know um marble songs and miami songs obviously are going to be in the show <laughs> as production progresses and as we get closer to an air date i would love to catch up with you again and, and hear more about this absolutely and there's one other thing there's a band um a female band with three 16 year old girls i trying to remember their name They did a cover of Red Light that was pretty good a few years ago. It must be great to have that sort of legacy, and I can vouch for that song, Red Lights. That was the song that grabbed me first. I think that's one of the great pop gems of the 1970s. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, Yeah, it's uh, nice to know that people still like the the song. We we still get uh, comments on it, um, you know, as being something that's uh, had an impact on people. So that's, uh, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. Well, Howard, it's been a real pleasure. And once again, I just want to tell you how excited I am for this television series. And I really do think it's time that a lot of these bands that maybe got lost in the fold uh, receive the recognition they deserve. That's exactly right. And that's what the, that's what the series is going to be about. And, uh, but uh, I'll be happy to share more with you as we, as we go along. So feel free to stay in touch. Howard, thank you again. And thank you to everyone who listened. If you're not that familiar with Marbles, if you if you've never heard them before, maybe know one or two songs, go on YouTube right now. There is a wealth, there's a rabbit hole uh, to, to easily get lost down. Um, songs like Closing Me Down, which is probably my favorite Marvel song. Um, go check them out. Watch the videos. This is a band that really uh, played an important role in the early development of, of CBGBs. And uh, again, uh, a, a whole lot of material out there beyond those two seven inches that were released, um, all of which holds up and all of which is well worth listening to. Thank you once again, everyone, for listening. I've got some very exciting interviews coming up that I can't wait to share. I've got a couple uh, focused on the Akron sound, the Ohio punk scene of the late 1970s, as well as a little suite of episodes I'm putting together documenting the history of Stiff Records. So I'm very excited to share these with you guys. Until then, I'm Charles Epting, and this is the Lost Labels Podcast. (laughs) 